Okay, I'd like to start with a. Oops, sorry, too quick. With the the three main questions that the book seeks to answer, which are, or which motivated me to write this book, and then the first question was, what is the scope for individual agency in extreme moral circumstances such as wartime occupation? The the second question then linked to the aftermath. Uh, how do states and societies, social communities, and individuals confront the legacies of war and occupation? And what do truth, guilt, and justice mean in that process? And the third one is, how does the process of confronting the past, quote unquote, play out with an authoritarian state, in this case, a dictatorship like the Soviet Union? So the book examines um, people's choices and their choiceless choices or impossible choices under Nazi occupation and the ways in which these then shape post-war Soviet rule. And it does so through the lens of Soviet Belarus, the Soviet Republic and East European borderland that was um, particularly affected by the war. As you can see, oh, again, too quick, maybe I'll use this here. Okay, as you can see here on these maps, um, Soviet Belarus was established in 1919 out of the turmoil of war and revolution. The Republic of Venice was initially quite small. Um, so on this, this larger map here, you see what denotes one, the regions one, two, three. Um, this is, these are the, the um, territories of Belarus um, in the interwar years. And then in 1939, it doubled its territory and population size when following the Hitler-Stalin pact, the Soviet Union annexed Eastern Poland. And then Northeastern Poland became Western Belarus. So this is the part you see on. For him. Then after 1945, Bialystok um, province was handed back to Poland, but um, most of Western Belarus was then retained by the Soviet Union. And on that map up here, uh, not the oil visible, but there you can see just a map of the, the Soviet annexations in 1939 and 1940. Then on June 22, 1941, Germany broke the pact and invaded the Soviet Union. Belarus was under German occupation from the summer of 1941 to the summer of 1944, when the Red Army then liberated the region from Nazi. And this is um, a, a map that shows the administrative division of Belarus under Nazi occupation. German occupation brought incredible death and destruction to the Soviet Western regions, and Belarus was among the hardest hit places. About 19 to 22% of the population that by June 1941 lived in the territories that would constitute post-1945 in Belarus were killed or died as a direct result of the war. Now, as I was um, thinking about this book and, and um, doing research in archives and in libraries across um, Eastern Europe, I found that there are two particular challenges in writing this book. And the first challenge was to account for the complexity of people's wartime choices. The Nazi occupation regime was obviously a regime of death and destruction, but it was also a regime that depended on the limited involvement of some. In the occupied territories, the authorities pursued different strategies toward different population groups. While the Jewish population was singled out for destruction, the Slavic population was treated with a mix of brutality and cooptation. In both Soviet regions under military and civilian rule, the German administration depended heavily on the employment of Soviet citizens. And in each district, Soviet citizens were appointed as town and district mayors and as local policemen. The Germans also by and large kept the organizational structure of the Soviet administration's lower levels intact, meaning that many who had worked, for example, as office clerks in a Soviet city administration, then continued to work in the same positions under the Germans. All of this meant that for civilians in occupied territory, it was impossible not to come in contact with the occupation regime. Some people actively joined the German side and took part in atrocities, for example, as local policemen who participated in the murder of the Jewish community. Others, however, became much more reluctantly, even unwillingly, complicit or entangled in Nazi policies. So with the wide spectrum of potential complicity, perhaps even wider spectrum of entanglements. It was also impossible to stay neutral in the fight between Soviet partisans on the one hand and Germans and local policemen on the other. Hand. 
And that was, um, was from, from 1942 and developed so it was at the extent of Soviet partisan warfare against the Germans. Um, and then in parts of Western Belarus, so the part um, that used to be Northeastern Poland, this precarious situation for civilians who were stuck between all these sides was further complicated by the presence of Polish partisans, so units of the Amia Krajowa, and then in Southern Belarus towards the end of the war by the presence of Ukrainian nationals. In consequence, this means that people's decisions and their, um, their decisions varied over time. And many choices were also what we can call choiceless choices, to draw on a term um, employed or developed by Lawrence L. Langer. Um, for example, when um, a village head who um, represented sort of the, the German occupation regime on the lowest level had to decide whether to hand over fellow villages as forced labors to the Germans and fear punishment at the hands of Soviet partisans or refuse to do so and fear German punitive actions. Now, a second challenge in, um, that I kind of encountered in writing this was, um, book was to account for the ways in which pre-war Soviet rule affected the choices that people then subsequently made under the Germans. And this in turn is linked to the, the different interwar histories of Western and Eastern Belarus. By 1941, Eastern Belarus um, had been Soviet for roughly two decades. Western Belarus had only belonged to the Soviet Union since 1939. And the populations living in these two parts had thus experienced Soviet rule in different ways. To Eastern Belarus, Sovietization, which included the violent collectivization of agriculture, had come as what you can call a revolution from within, with um, significant local agency. To Western Belarus, it has come as an express Sovietization from abroad in the form of Red Army soldier and cadres from the East. In both cases, Soviet rule came with a specific, um, significant amount of state violence, with people killed or deported, actually even more so in Eastern Belarus than in Western Belarus. So in the book, then the, um, the comparison between the Eastern and the Western part, and also the comparison between Belarus and the other Soviet Western republics that were under German occupation is then woven into the main narrative. Okay, um, just a few words about, about the outline of the book. Um, so the, it begins at the turn of the century um, and, and then extends into the whole story. So the first chapter kind of gives the historical background to the, um, to the historical context and, and conceptualizes sort of this East European borderland as the test of space between different imperial and other powers. Um, the second chapter then zooms in to the warriors and looks particularly at, at people's wartime choices. And then the remainder of the book, the bulk of the book then looks at um, the immediate post-war years. So it's a story that's looking very much in the second half of the 1940s and early 1950s, although questions of memory also take it up to the 1960s and then um, sort of very briefly up to the present day. After the Red Army re-established control over the Soviet Western regions, one question shaped encounters between the Soviet um, authorities and those who had lived under Nazi rule, between soldiers and family members, re evacuees and colleagues, Holocaust survivors and their neighbors. What did you do during the war? So, in the remainder of the talk, I um, will first speak a little bit about prosecution and trials, um, then about personal ways of seeking justice and how that conflicted with the official Soviet war narrative. And then um, I'd like to conclude with a few thoughts on how um, the book relates to debates outside the field of, of European and Soviet history. So how it specifically connects to debates within um, transitional justice, war and society, and more generally global history, um, global history kind of discussions. So when the Soviets returned, the pursuit of truth was a common goal for individuals, communities, and the Soviet authorities alike. That they often had very different understandings of what that meant. For local party leaders, state security officers, so the NKVD and the NKGB, and members of the judiciary and procuracy, finding out what people in occupied territory had done was a task of utmost importance, inextricably linked to the re establishment of Soviet authority. The authorities were determined to punish local participation in German atrocities, and during the first post occupation years, they did prosecute, for example, Many policemen were taken part in the Holocaust or the killing of other civilians. 
At the same time, though, the search for alleged traitors was about defining who had and who had not been loyal to Moscow during the war. As military tribunals translated complex moral gray zones of war and occupation into the language of treason, external pressures or attempt were not taken into account. Mitigating circumstances were um, by military tribunals systematically only recognized if an individual but, um, had gone over to the, to the German, uh, Soviet side later on. So um, military tribunals across the board systematically only allow for mitigating circumstances if um, in cases of individuals who had first fought, for example, or served on the German side as local policemen, and then during the war went over to the Soviet side and fought with the partisans. So in this case, we can see that military tribunals who still prosecuted them after the war, then usually lowered their, their sentences. These sort of tensions between on the one hand, wanting to prosecute individuals who had committed crimes, and on the other hand, murder, for example, or abuse, ill treatment of civilians, but on the other hand, also the ideology that informed this process, these tensions then continue to inform later Soviet trials too. Um, the majority of people who were, um, who were charged with wartime treason were prosecuted until the early 1950s. Then we can see that um, after Stalin's death in 1953, as part of limited de-Stalinization efforts, the state moderated its punitive practices and in 1955 issued a partial amnesty. In the 1960s then, domestic and international changes spurred a second wave of trials. And the prosecution then continues until the 1980s. So there's a lot more that one could say about trials, um, but, but uh, and I would be happy to do so later on if, if there are any questions, but there are three points that I'd like to raise. So what's interesting about these trials is that we can see that um, contrary to official wartime proclamations, namely that all traitors um, only deserve one fate, death, punitive practice actions were not static, but varied over time, alternating throughout the post-war years between more lenient and stricter, less active and more expensive phases. The prosecution starts in early 1942, so during the war, when punishment is particularly harsh and indiscriminate. And it was not un uncommon, for example, that a cleaning lady, um, that somebody who worked as a cleaning lady for the Germans could receive the same sentence as a local police. The punishment then um, from early 1944 becomes somewhat less stricter. So we see the ratio of um, death sentences to prison sentences then further drop in the immediate post war years. And that's a trend that we can see across the Soviet Western region. There were also different types of trials. Um, so then the majority of people are prosecuted in secret, but um, select trials were open for the public. Although I should say that open for the public also entailed difference. Um, the majority of these public trials of Soviet citizens actually were not much publicized beyond the um, locality in which they took place. Um, and, and there's also again change from the war into the post-war years. So, while the war was still being fought, we see that um, the punishment of Soviet citizens in newly reconquered regions were frequently and deliberately conducted in front of local audiences in the, in the locality where somebody um, who had as a, acted as village elder or policeman had um, lived. And here um, you can see an example of one, one of these trials. Um, this village was taken, so we have very few, very few in general sort of images of these. these prosecutions which take place at the local level. That's the only image I've actually found of one of these early trials um, um, that are taking place as the Red Army sort of marching westward. Um, and this one comes from the Soviet Russia, the Smolensk region, um, which the Red Army liberated in, in late 1943. Um, now, obviously, you can say um, each photograph is staged, right? So, so there is a particular intention to the composition of it, but I think it nevertheless gives us a sense when we um, especially juxtapose it with memoirs by members of military tribunals of how improvised these early trials were. So they usually took place, you know, in, in a, under the open sky. Um, kind of hard to make out, but you see a jury of three officers. Um, the local audience is probably composed of it's mostly women, I'm assuming they are, they are local um, uh, inhabitants of that village. And then that army soldiers, and even a few children are present. 
And then the person who's standing on trial is sort of to the, to the center, right? Who's standing in front of the, um, the jury composed of these three elders. Um, he was the, the village elder who was accused of having handed over Komsomol members to the, to the Germans. Once then this first kind of wave of prosecution kind of seizes, um, the, the state security organs then take over from the Red Army military tribunals and the prosecution mostly takes place in secret. Also, select trials are then continue to be open to the public in the immediate post war years. So I said, there is a, we see that um, when it comes to these trials, we can see that they are alternating between more lenient and stricter, less active, more expansive phases in response to shifting domestic and international um, factors and, and constellations. We also see that there are shifts in visibilities with these um, secret trials or secret prosecution, a select um, um, a number of public trials, and then yet public yet not much publicized trials where where knowledge of a trial was supposed to stay within the local community. Um, and for example, wasn't mentioned in any newspapers beyond the district where a trial had taken, taken place. And the third kind of point I'd like to, to make or mention about these trials is that um, throughout the, the 1940s, 1950s, and especially the 1960s, when a second wave of trial takes place, especially public trials, which are connected very much to um, a shifting kind of a global shift in the prosecution of, um, of uh, war crimes during the Second World War. There's also an improvement in the administration of justice, by which I mean that um, um, the, the state security organs who carry out the pre-trial investigations continue to gather a lot more evidence or material um, before they put an individual on trial. So these early, early trials usually leave very little um, um, documents in the archives. And then later on, we have much more um, material that we as historians can also draw. But um, this was a question about administration of justice, meaning the, I think the, the um, applicability or the technical, technical applicability of the law, so to say. Um, there is, of course, the, the tension that, um, especially in these public trials, it's local policemen and people who have served in the SS forces are put on trial. So it's very likely that some or even many or all of them had committed the acts that they're accused of. But the Soviet justice system as such doesn't change. So the basic parameters remain. Um, and these sort of are that Soviet trials continue to lack fundamental standards of the rule of law. By which I mean, there's no independent judiciary, no independent defense attorneys, and in especially these public trials, not, not the assumption of innocent and proven guilty. Um, I mean, maybe we have time later on the discussion to speak about also the difference in, in these legal standards, and then the question of what historical trial records can nevertheless answer. So the questions that we can apply as historians and, and what they, um, whether sort of the legal analysis of these trials would differ from the historical analysis. Okay, um, and now I'd like to shift to sort of more personal responses and ways of seeking justice and accountability in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, in contrast to the authorities who were preoccupied with the question of political loyalty, for many inhabitants of post war Belarus, confronting people's wartime choices was a highly individualized process, contingent on a multitude of interacting factors, circumstances, and personal experiences. Most cities in Belarus lay in ruins, entire rural mm -hmm. districts have been burned down, and large parts of the population were uprooted or displaced. For private individuals, the moment of return was first and foremost about the much hoped for reunion with family. Returning home, also led to encounters though, with former neighbors and friends, fellow villagers and colleagues. These encounters not only threw into sharp relief that some, in particular Jews, had lost more than others during the war, they also in inevitably so raised questions about people's wartime behavior. Now we might, we might assume that, that in a dictatorship like Stalin's Soviet Union, individuals would shy away altogether from talking about the war in ways that might deviate from the official line. That was not the case, though. 
So example, when um, Russell Bukow, who you see here on the upper, on the upper right, who, um, who was a Red Army soldier during the Second World War, he came from a, a very small village in north, northeastern Belarus, just in the border, um, on the, on the pre-1939 border, and later on the Kilmatevus, um, right on the post west Soviet Union. So when he returned to his village, Bichki, after the war, fellow villagers came over at night and recounted how much they had to suffer during the war. And I'm quoting here from his memoirs, from the Germans, from the partisans, from the Narodniki, probably local policemen, amongst others also from some people who came from some villages, in particular from the same villages, in particular from those who up to the war had been Soviet activists and during the war tried hard to serve the Germans. So as neighbors and acquaintances met in social settings, they did talk frankly about the war, including sensitive topics such as violence committed by Soviet partisans. Yet if people spoke about taking furniture from Jewish apartments, stealing food from villagers, or serving in the German organized police forces, they usually always referred to other locals as having done such things, not themselves. And they needed a lot of personal determination and assistance to overcome people's reluctance to respond to uncomfortable questions in particular ones that might have brought to light their own entanglement in wrongdoings or crime. I found in my research that I think it was mostly um, Holocaust survivors who had a very strong personal interest in finding out the um, individuals who survived the war um, fighting with the partisans or in the Red Army had a very strong personal motivation of finding out what had happened in a particular, in their hometown during the war who then approached people directly and asked them, what happened here? Um, how was my family killed? Who served in the local police forces, for example? When individuals found out or surmised that members of the previous social communities had become complicit or entangled in Nazi crimes, or that their neighbors had taken advantage of other people's flight, they responded in different ways. Some saw comfort in the social relations that had survived the friendship and solidarities that had not been destroyed by what people had done or not done during the war. Often people cut all ties with those whom they suspected of wrongdoings. So this was the case, for example, with Olga Mjernil Jedok, who you can see here on the, um, on the upper um, right. She was uh, an artist from originally from Roma and later on moved to Minsk. Um, and um, her nephew, Igor, who was a former Red Army soldier, had fallen into German captivity and then subsequently worked as a translator for the Germans. And in her, in her memoirs, she details how when her family found out about this, they eventually decided to send him a letter in which they explained that they wanted to sever all ties with him. There's also disagreement though within her family. So her sister Anastasia, for example, took a very different position and essentially um, told her that she didn't quite understand that you know they wouldn't be able to understand the situation or the, the pressure under which she came to work for the Germans. But for for um, Olga Mimodjerov, this was very much a moral question about um, um, and because of that she wanted to sever ties with him. Others like Liebman Moore, who can, you can see here on the um, upper left, um, he was a Holocaust survivor from David Harador, a small town in, in the southwestern um, Belarus. Um, he was imprisoned in the Vilnius ghetto, then fled from the ghetto and fought with the Soviet Partisan Unit, eventually becoming a Soviet Partisan Unit in Lithuanian Belarusian um, borderlands. And in 1944, he then <clears throat> travels all the way from Vilnius to his hometown because he wants to find out um, whether anyone in his family had survived. And for him, in his memoirs, he describes very much this moment of walking through his little and um, his small hometown and encountering only absences and void, but also very much a local reluctance to talk. And it's particularly this moment then when he encounters furniture um, that his family once owned in the neighbor's apartment, that this is a, sort of a very, um, I think what we would call today a traumatic moment where he then decides that he's never going to return and he's going to leave the Soviet Union for good. This in itself was, was as an option only available to a few. So it only pertained to um, ethnic Poles, and Jews from, from formerly Northeastern Poland, who were then able to leave the Soviet Union under the 1944 to 46 Soviet Polish population exchange agreement. Mm. As very though, I'm going to read this because I want to show Arsene von Schnabelitka's image. Um, as varied as people's responses to the ghosts of war were, one sentiment was widely shared by inhabitants of Belarus, and that was the urge to seek justice and retribution 
by which I mean punishment that people believed to be morally right. In its most extreme form, retribution meant revenge violence. For example, by beating up a fellow villager who was accused of having worked for the Germans, as has been reported especially from villages in Eastern and Western Belarus in the fall of 1944. Yet individuals also pursued many other, less physical means of retribution. Some did so privately, for example, by confronting neighbors directly, demanding the restitution of property that these had acquired during the war. At times that was successful, at times not. When Rasia bonstein Bilitska, you can see here on the upper left, um, returned after the war, for example, to Grodno. So she, um, she was first imprisoned in the Grodno ghetto, then taken to the Bialystok ghetto from which she fled, and then, then she was able to, to survive um, um, posing as a, or um, pretending to be a Polish girl from the villages, and later on also had ties to the resistance movement. So when she returns in 1944 to Grodno, she um, found her family house intact, but the person who was now living in it would not let her end. She then decides not to pursue the issue further because she had already set her mind on, on leaving um, and uh, making her way to Palestine. Um, so there, there are these private efforts in which people try to have property, for example, um, restituted or returned to them. But beyond these, many individuals found that um, found themselves brought into contact with the Soviet state. In the efforts to determine what Soviet citizens had done, um, under Nazi rule, the authorities relied heavily on local information, on an assortment of names, clues, and stories. Some of these were supplied unwilling, such as when tortured during interrogations, made people provide or fabricate incriminating material about friends or neighbors, or when people were blackmailed into becoming informers. Others agreed to become informers for the state security organs because they saw this as a chance to punish locals they believed guilty of crimes committed in the name of German power. While some consented to pass on information to the state after they were approached by its representatives, many more acted on their own initiative and wrote letters to the central authorities. Testifying to the state, whether to the members of the Extraordinary State Commission, the Czech Eka, or if possible as a witness at a public trial was another means to which individuals could seek retribution. In doing so, some people found that their individual notions of what constituted morally right punishment overlapped or were even congruent with those of the regime. So for example, when the authorities acted on their tip and arrested a neighbor they believed to have committed crimes in the name of Nazi power, even someone who otherwise was not sympathetic to Soviet power could see the state as a guarantor of justice. The same could apply to individuals who served as witnesses in court. Although we also know, especially from research um, that's been conducted on, on former Yugoslavia, so the aftermath of the civil war in Yugoslavia, that this question of, of what criminal prosecution actually means to witnesses that it tries is a very complicated question um, and often heavily sort of dependent on the specific circumstances in which an individual finds himself, the wartime history, and then um, the ways in which the trial takes place. Thus, the could find justice. Um, the widespread desire for punishment otherwise made it possible for some inhabitants of post rebellions to find moral justice, but other leaders in Belarusian, within a state whose legal system was and remained profoundly illegal. At the same time, though, interactions with the authorities came at its own risk. People who engaged with the state could, of course, only do so on the terms set by the authorities. There were boundaries to what could be said and done, and investigations could backfire on those who initially set them in motion. Nowhere did this become more visible than in the many property cases. What belonged to whom was an immensely contested, um, contentious question in the immediate post war years. It was a deeply personal question and at the same time highly political. The death and displacement of hundreds of thousands of people, and in particular of the region's Jews, and the destruction of houses as a result of military operations or German punitive actions, meant that a lot of property, be it apartments, furniture or clothes had passed through many different hands during the war. Just how did you manage to move into a new apartment during the war? Because the Germans had burned down your house as punishment for ties to the partisans? Or because, as we know from, from a few cases, the partisans had burned down your house as punishment for the ties to the Germans? Or because a bomb had destroyed your house and you simply needed a new place to stay? Property conflicts weren't limited to housing questions. 
How did you come to buy new furniture, clothes? How did you come to owe a cow during the war? Did you take it from the collective farm after the Soviet state took it from you during the collectivization of agriculture in the 1930s? Did you receive it from the governments where services rendered to them? If you bought it from someone, how did that person acquire it? So I think this is, um, when we think about sort of, you know, kind of future research, this is in itself a topic, post-war property um, or wartime property circulation and then ways of, of uh, post-war property restitution that um, were still much is not known. I think, especially in smaller, in the former, smaller towns, the former shtetls, a lot of um, what the Jewish property was sold and resold on the market. Um, and I think we could probably speculate that especially in smaller towns, almost every inhabitant in some ways owned in these smaller towns in, a, in countries that were ravaged by the war, which were extremely poor, almost every inhabitant probably owned some piece of Jewish property after the war. And so obviously this is a, a, a morally and ethically um, um, a highly complicated question. Um, and, and one where um, I think from a historical point of view, um, much research could um, probably still be done. What that meant then for post-war communities. So again, these questions are, how did you come to acquire property and what did you do to acquire property during the war inevitably arose when trying to solve widespread conflicts, which is why I think we can read them as one of the ways in which people in Belarus grappled with the ghost of war, so people's wartime choices. Sorting them out was an inherently difficult task, both practically as well as morally. And Red Army soldiers, Holocaust survivors, or former partisans often turned to the state, asking the authorities to settle the question of ownership or occupancy rights in their favor. In doing so, they had no choice but to work with Soviet normative categories, with the authorities' notion of right and wrong wartime behavior. In consequence, it was, of course, impossible to seek justice for wartime wrongdoings believed to have been committed in the name of the Soviet state. So a peasant, for example, could not complain to Minsk that Soviet partisans had stolen his cow during the war. Had he done so, he would have made himself suspicious. Why did you not give the cow voluntarily to the Soviet partisans? The partisans were officially deemed unambiguous heroes and defenders of the socialist motherland. In the Soviet narrative of the wars and all people's war, Belarus occupied a special, a special place as the republic where the all people's partisan war had taken place. According to this narrative, the local population in both the republic's western and its eastern part had, with the exception of a few, stood firm, firmly behind Soviet power. And so one way in which this was then, then shown and represented in, in newspapers later on um, from the 1960s on also a very large memoir on uh, sort of literature that emerges on, on the so-called Partisan Republic, Partisanska Respublika. One of these examples you can see here on the right, so a very early one, taken from the main newspaper of Belarus, um, Sovietska Belarusia, um, which depicts um, which depicts sort of partisan meeting red army soldiers um, under a flag that reads death to the German occupiers for our Soviet mother. So in this respect, this narrative of the, the partisan dystopic um, was also about the creation of a new linear story of Soviet Belarusian statehood, one which firmly united the, the Eastern part, the old Soviet territories with Western Belarus, which had only become Soviet in 1939, under the banner of the, the partisan republic. Um, after Stalin's death in 1953, the general Soviet war narrative and its specific Belarusian version became more inclusive. And within limits, some of its aspects could be contested. But because of the centrality of the All People's Partisan War to post war Soviet Belarusian statehood, there was no space to acknowledge that the relationship between Soviet partisans and civilians in occupied territory had been fragile, unequal, fraught with conflicts, and at times antagonistic. And this exclusively positive depiction of the partisan civilian relationship was and remains to this day non negotiable in Belarus. And I think for that matter, in, in Russia too. So violence committed by Soviet partisans on civilians is political taboo. And, and if one wants to challenge that, it, it comes with high professional and, and social costs. Um, what anthropologists who have um, conducted sort of systematic interviews with the, the villagers throughout um, um, Belarus have found is that privately some individuals try to make sense of this discrepancy between official and private memory by distinguishing between real partisans, quote unquote, who then could be honored and paid tribute to, 
and quote unquote partisans, on the other hand. So they would say, when they recount the wartime experience, they would say, um, and they would always speak about um, people who are officially part of the partisan movement, but they would say, these individuals were individuals were real partisans. They didn't take food by force. You know, they, they asked for it, we gave it to them. But there are also others, and there were the bandits who took it by force. Mm -hmm. So you have a kind of um, cognitive kind of separation in some ways. But even this reframing of their wartime experiences could publicly only be articulated at the cost of exclusion from the larger political community. So those who felt that Soviet power had done them an injustice, either during the war at the hands of the partisans or after the war at the hands of Soviet officials resorted to particular strategies in order to mobilize the state on their behalf. They would let us to party leaders in which they accused others of being German accomplices. So the idea was then that the state would become involved and hopefully settle your conflicts. Um, although this was also a very risky strategy because the, the state security organs then often started to investigate the individuals themselves who stood with in this letter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this brings me to the confusion and um, two thoughts on where I see the book connecting to debates outside the field of, of European and Soviet history. So for one, the, the, the scholarship on transitional justice, which has been developed very much by mostly anthropologists, political scientists, um, lawyers who are working in the field of law and society, um, which draws very much on, um, on empirical cases from um, post-war Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, um, that scholarship um, implicitly assumes that seeking justice and accountability in the aftermath of war and violence contributes to the development of more pluralist democratic spheres. So one thing that I was interested in this book was to see what it meant like to seek justice for wartime atrocities in a dictatorship. Was that possible? What are the different meanings of justice? What are the different meanings of truth? And and um, but what, what I hope that I found is that while there was space to do so, um, obviously on the terms set by the authority, seeking accountability could unintentionally also contribute actually to the strengthening of state power. So what do we mean by that? Um, for example, when, when individuals turn to the state and they ask them to settle wartime conflicts in their favor, the authorities usually benefited from, from these letters, regardless of how then the, the conflict is being, is being solved or not. So we can say that on a more abstract level, complaint letters to the regime acknowledge that the Soviet state alone had the means to settle the conflicts brought forward by the authors. This importance of the affirmation of Soviet state authority, I think shouldn't be underestimated. In particular, when you consider how rapidly institutions in the Western regions collapsed in the summer of 1941. So I think you can say that unintentionally, Quote unquote, confronting the past in this case had a regime stabilizing effect, leading not to the creation of more open public spheres, but instead strengthening the mechanisms of how power operated in an authoritarian state. And secondly, um, how could this sort of case of Soviet prosecutions and, and trials of those considered <clears throat> collaborators with the Germans, how does this connect more generally to, to literature on, on what we can call the global moment of post Second World War justice? And when the war ended, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of individuals were put on trial for the wartime activities in almost all former belligerent countries. This was a, a global moment, not just because similar types of trials took place in very different political settings throughout all of Europe and Asia, but it was also a global moment because it was shaped by the diffusion of new legal norms and ideas that had been created for and developed at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. At the same time, this moment also retains many national features, which is then reflected in the search for alleged traitors that took place in all countries emerging from wartime occupation. Now, if we now look at the Soviet prosecutions of those deemed wartime collaborators, <laughs> what can that contribute to that, to that research on that global moment of justice? Now, I think what's interesting with the, the Soviet trials, we see that how they are, um, the, the prosecutions, and the ways you know, which they go through these waves of stricter, more lenient, um, more expensive, less expensive phases is often uh, always shaped by a set of domestic and international circumstances and considerations. 
the um, at these public trials, there's also always a discursive connection being um, that has been drawn between collaboration trials, um, which have otherwise a very domestic local audience, and then then more internationally oriented trials. So this includes Nuremberg, of course, but it also includes a series of 18 public trials of um, German and other Axis soldiers that took place in the second half of the 1940s in the Soviet Union. Um, and we can see how the language of Nuremberg informs these trials as well, and how then on the local level, sort of all these different levels are just perfectly connected. I also think that the, the case of um, post-war Soviet prosecutions can, um, can make a contribution to literature and inter criminal law, international criminal law, and also to theories of, of what constitutes political justice. So as, as scholars working on um, the Western allies, um, war crimes trials have shown is that in both Europe and Asia, these trials often did not live up, live up to their liberal legal standards or did not live up to the, the standards that these, um, that these uh, states like the US or the, um, the British start to um, uphold at home. A mix of procedural shortcomings, including looser, looser rules of evidence or denying suspects and defendants the same rights that Western allied country nationals were granted in domestic courts usually accounted for that. In Asia, there's another level sort of a complexity because we see that European um, colonial empires often use trials of Japanese military personnel as a means to reassert their authorities in former colonies that have been under Japanese rule during the war. But on a more theoretical sort of level, there are also sort of these flaws within what you can call liberal justice systems um, have also been theorized so on this, this um, level on, on debates about, about the nature of what, you know, what is the connection between politics and law and, and what does political justice mean? Um, and one of the main um, interventions comes from Judith um, Schla, who has argued that even a liberal state's law is never about politics. She then draws a distinction between ordinary criminal justice and political justice, um, the latter of which is aimed at the elimination of the political enemy through the use of the courtroom. And then, sorry to kind of complicate this further, but then she, she introduces a second distinction with what she calls good political justice, in which she says Nuremberg would be an example, and bad political justice. Mm. So there's a, there's a rich literature um, I'm kind of brief, but there's a rich literature that looks sort of at differences within liberal justice systems. And also, again, as said, at this connection between politics and law. Um, but we don't really have a good sense yet of differences within a liberal justice system. But which I mean, a system where these basic parameters of the rule of law are not fulfilled, but where we nevertheless see a wide variety of trials and prosecution taking place. So especially the, the more theoretical literature on inter the history of international criminal law usually subsumes all trials, war crime trials, collaboration trials that takes place um, in illiberal justice system under the heading of short trials. And then the historical example that's being used are the trials of um, old Bolshevik party members from nine, that, that took place from 1936 to 1938 in Moscow, where you had um, no independent judges, no independent defense attorney, where the, the outcome of the trial in many ways was predetermined, the, the basic sort of the more general outcome of the trial, and where the fabricated was largely, the evidence was largely fabricated. But I think what, what the example of these post-war trials can show, particularly the example of trials of German and Axis soldiers, collaboration trials, it comes a little bit murky or messier, is that um, we obviously have, have differences with illegal justice systems as well. So for example, in the case of German soldiers put on trial, there were actual acts obviously committed. So there's no need to fabricate evidence. The problem that Soviet trials faced, and that's also the case in the collaboration trials, is then to actually link the individual on trial to the acts of which there was an abundance of evidence, but to make that connection and really be able to say um, that an individual was criminally responsible for these acts. And this is what these trials because of the, the larger legal parameters cannot do. But again, I think they can give us, give us sort of a more nuanced, a richer empirical sense of differences within the liberal systems where you have these trials, which are often predetermined an outcome, but the acts were actual acts that have been committed. So I leave it at that. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>
and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Francisca. What a fabulous talk. So much food for thought. I think I'm taking away also a lot of very subtle reflections and also expressions such as the wide spectrum of complicities that you showed us, but also the wide spectrum of connections between individual morality and state justice. And I think in your conclusion, you really pointed towards a, a very exciting broader field. I mean, this seeking to study the differences within illiberal um, justice systems, I think was really a, a very, very um, thought-provoking ending to your talk. And I definitely have many questions, but I'll, <laughs> I'll um, step back for a moment because I'm sure that there are also many questions from the audiences to Francesca to, about her archival material, how she connects these um, individual memoirs and, and straight archives um, to, to the outline of her book. There are many questions to you um, to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Eva? Uh, it's going to be very much archives related question. Um, thank you very much for the talk and congratulations again on the book. Um, following up on, on what Valenta said about your conclusions about um, paying um, more attention to subtle, um, not so subtle differences within the liberal practice. I wonder if there is a bit of a tension um, uh, between that conclusion and um, this argument that you started your conclusion with, saying that seeking justice and accountability in a dictatorship more or less automatically um, has a state stabilizing stabilizing effect. So I'm just curious whether you see that um, to be true across these different phases also that you mapped out um, of uh, people seeking justice and accountability in Belarus, um, or whether there's perhaps different difference over time um, in terms of the, the state stabilizing sorry stabilizing effect and also how do you, I guess, how do you measure um, uh, a state stabilizing effect? Um, mm -hmm. Sure, I was just thinking. Thanks so much um, for that question. It's a really good question. Um, I think my argument would be that the state stabilizing effect is something that I deduced from this practice of writing letters. Um, because there's also there's quite a lot of literature on the practice of letter writing jollaby in the Soviet Union, the fact that people try to um, try and, and we can see that it's not in the Soviet Union, but in other systems as well, but especially in systems where where individuals feel often powerless in the face with a strong state, then they feel directly to individuals in that state and, and approach them personally to, and, and seek sort of um, uh, seek their help in various ways. And, and that um, these, these letters that are written to the state for the 1920s and 30s, sometimes some people have often called them denunciations. But I think we do need a more refined set of kind of vocabulary when you talk about them. Because for somebody who writes a letter to the state authorities in 44 and says, my neighbor worked as a local policeman for the Germans and took part in the killing of others and other, other neighbors, um, that was not a denunciation per se. Like this was a way of sort of seeking Finding, finding justice and seeing that person being brought on trial. So, so on a side note, I think what you know what somebody perceives as a denunciation or not depends very much on the perspective of the individual and the motivation behind that. But I think the state stabilizing effect I would describe mostly to this practice of writing letters, whereas with these trials, um, and that's how I also understood your question when we look at, at these trials, extremely difficult to, to know for sure what that actually meant for, for individuals. So. Um, um, maybe I can actually show. So this is sort of related to a postdoc project, which looks more at uh, the prosecution of, of, um, of what you can call Soviet war crimes prosecutions. The prosecution of German and Axis soldiers is connected to the prosecution of Soviet citizens and then to Nuremberg. And there was a say, this, this series of public trials that took place um, in the Soviet Union, and, and they usually had an international starting point. So there's the, the first wave is tied to Nuremberg. The second one in 47 is tied to the Soviet trial of Sachsenhausen concentration camp personnel in East Berlin. 
And then the last one, uh, um, the Kabal was um, um, where Japanese soldiers were put on trial tied to the um, sort of preceding international military tribunal for the fights at Tokyo. But what's interesting about these trials um, is that, um, so this is, for example, so it's an image of a trial of German and Hungarian soldiers that took place at Chernihiv in Ukraine in 1947, that the state security organs always place in foremost throughout the court of the courtroom. So it's very difficult, or I find it very difficult to find memoirs by people who talk about these trials. We do have state security audience responses, which are then later on written, collected. Um, so these in, in, in individuals who are put throughout the courtroom then report to the state authority on um, state security organs what they heard people say in the courtroom. Now that's obviously a very difficult source also, right? Because we don't know the extent to which that was authentic, to which people really thought what they said, whether they were um, expecting that somebody might be an informant. So they say things that they think sort of falls in line with that. But I think um, there's a variety of voices within these audience reports. And so I think it points to the difficulty of actually knowing what it is exactly and a trial meant from individuals. So I think a trial could have very different meanings and purposes as perceived by an individual. And so, um, so I, I wouldn't apply the states, sort of come to sort of, a, you know, to hear your question, I wouldn't apply the states that stabilizing argument to these trials, because I think that would be too far of a stretch, because we know too little and probably won't be able to find out what they actually, how people perceive them in the audience and whether that contributed to that. Um, there's some, again, like some memos and indicators where we see that in some individuals did find them as, um, find, find that the Soviet state was a guarantor of justice in, in their cases. But to make that argument for the 1960s, when, when the domestic setting was also different, um, that's something I didn't research for the book. That would be something for, for future research, maybe to see whether that applies as well. Yeah, thanks. Very good. The increasingly ossified nature of the cult of the party government, the post war Belarus, was in a sense maybe almost a deliberate attempt to uh, gloss over the complexity of actual behavior during the war and to provide kind of a framework for people to continue to live together. Now, I'm thinking of uh, Masha, right, who was the, the head of uh, Soviet Belarus back in 1965, who was really, I think, one of the main instigators of, of this, the promoters of this cult. But who also um, had been, and I, I'm pretty sure she was the only one of all Soviet um, heads of, of republics, um, had been a prisoner of war, briefly, right? So, um, obviously, it's much easier to talk about you know, heroism and, and partisans than about being in captivity. So, if you think of the connection there. And the second question, I guess, is, is broader, um, but related more specifically to the period that you were talking about. How, how do you see the articulation between um, kind of general Soviet policy of uh, getting to terms with the war, but also of um, building and rebuilding communal life and the specific Belarusian context. And I'm thinking, for example, of uh, this, this wave of student essays um, that people who had lived through occupation were made to write immediately after the break. There's a really interesting Ukrainian study on this. Um, where you know, people were kind of you know, educated to, to talk about their experiences in, in a Bolshevik way. Um, so how is that articulated with the things that you described? Or things like um, you know, practices of communal denunciation that people also read about um, quite a lot. Was, was that something that people drew on in these local trials that you talk about? Or were the roots much more in the kind of legal culture that came through the bigger trials? You mean the, the local trials and the, the second half of 40 yes. then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks so much um, for these questions. So the, the, the one about like, what was the purpose of this, this narrative of the Soviet Partisan Republic? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've chosen to use the word narrative and not myth, because I think myth often in, it seems to suggest that something was entirely Fabricated, which I think it's not like. I think, the, but if you speak about narrative, there's a sense of there's an official state story, um, and and narrative 
puts the focus on trying to create a linear story, one that is unambiguous, that, that doesn't have, that this, this doesn't contradict itself in some ways. And so this is what, what the Belarus, the, the parties of the public does. I think it fulfills these several levels. Like in, in Belarus is part of the larger Soviet war narrative. Um, and so there are many similarities to in more generally all people's war, the war as an effort of, of not, not inhabitants of the Soviet Union, but of Soviet people fighting against the Nazis. But then there's also this, as I said, the specific Belarusian version. And um, I do think it serves to, to um, it serves for one to, to kind of try to, um, to, to um, sideline and ignore all of these and, and, um, uh, and um, erase all of these difficult issues um, and contentious issues. And also where um, the, the problem, the, the, the very fragile um, relationship to Soviet partisans, the fact that one side had guns and the other was not. And so they are always in a, in a position in a, in a relationship of hierarchy, the civilians to the Soviet partisans. Um, but it's also interesting that this narrative is mostly put forth by people like um, Panamarenko, who was the first secretary of Belarus during the war, um, was also the head of the Soviet partisan movement. But he and others start to put forth this narrative during the war, although they actually don't have any experience fighting within the force themselves. Um, so um, they also use that narrative to cover up, for example, that they fled from Minsk um, three days after the German invasion um, and spent the war in the rear. Whereas we see in the immediate post war years, on the level, very much on the local level of the party committees, of the state executive committees, that many partisans or members of the partisan movement who'd actually fought in the war are removed from positions of power. So there's also this between where, who, who has the power to tell a story and who doesn't. And it's the ones who survived the war in the rear and, and were in, um, and where people who usually, people like Panamarenka, Sanaba was the head of the state security forces. There are people who, whose career really accelerates during the Great Terror. So they benefit from the internal party purchase in the late 1930s. And then the war gives their career really boost. Um, in many ways. And so this is why they also came to that narrative. On a sort of a side comment, Panamarenko is also the one who um, crafts a particular version of Belarusian suffering during the war. Um, and it, this already starts during the war. And it's one in which he, I think, deliberately plays with this sense um, with the word narod, which can be understood as meaning so he, um, of the um, Belaruski narod, which can be understood theoretically in an inclusive sense to mean all inhabitants of Belarus, regardless of whether they were Christian or Jewish, um, Belarusian, Russian, um, Polish speaking, but it could also be understood in a very ethnic sense and only mean ethnic Belarusians. And already in, in, um, in a Pravda article, for example, during the war, um, Ponamarenko speaks of the, of the killings of civilians and the examples that he gives are examples, as we know today, of the killings of Jewish communities in Eastern Belarus. But he doesn't say that. Um, he knows that because in, from internal communication, we know that he's written to Stalin that the Jewish communities of Belarus are being killed in, in, on a mass scale. Um, in, in, so this is very early on, the knowledge is there in the polyver. But he doesn't, doesn't reveal their Jewish identity, but then connects it to the sort of saying, and here we see how the Belarus is being, um, is being exterminated. So he kind of suggests that people who are being killed during the war are not sort of the multi-ethnic society of Belarus, but they are ethnic Belarusians. Um, and not to draw too many sort of larger kind of you know, comparisons, but we see something similar happening in Belarus today. Um, so there's a very strict memory law now in place um, that the Belarusian government, um, the Koshenko government has put in place, um, which says that the de um, any denial um, that, quote unquote, a genocide of the Belarusian people took place during the war carries a prison sentence of up to 10 years. Um, so this was put in place in 2022. It's really unclear where this is going. It can be used against everybody, obviously. Uh, every, every historian who deviates from the official narrative. Um, look at the Lukashenko government is also now, um, all the files that I've looked at, or many of the files that I looked at pertaining to the warriors are currently off limits for historians because the prosecutor's office is going through them because they're going, they're trying to construct um, um, and find new, new evidence on, um, on uh, in Belarusians who collaborated with the Germans during the war, so people who served in SS formations, and then draw a, a connection between 
the white, red, white flag used by the opposition movement, which is historically sort of the alternative Belarusian um, version, which was also worn by, by um, Belarusian collaborators during the war, and essentially then make it possible to kind of draw this connection with saying everybody who protests against the Lukashenko government today is a fascist, and here we have the sources from the Second World War. Very simple, but um, shockingly and, and terribly effective. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a really long <laughs> answer. I'll be so tired. Rebuilding the Soviet context. Really interesting. Um, again, like I mostly ended with these trials in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and it's very difficult to find really extensive materials on them. So, so a lot has to remain guesswork there. I think there's a lot more potential for these trials in the 1960s. So, Irina Skolokina, for example, um, has written about these later trials and the function that they fulfilled, especially in the emerging Cold War. Because here we can, um, in the second wave of trials, we can even more so see the global connections where, um, where there's a series of public trials in the Soviet Union, a series of trials in East Germany that's taking place. And they're being um, used by the Soviet Union to also accuse the US and the UK um, of harboring war criminals. So individuals who, who served, for example, Ukrainian nationalists or people who served in local police forces. And then after the Second World War came to the UK or um, the US as displaced persons. Um, and they, they, the Soviet uh, sort of uh, accusations are often really correct. So that's also another level of complexity that comes in there. They also use them to, to look at, to point out the, the personnel continuities and the bias within the West um, German judiciary, for example. And so in this, the second trial, this wave of trials, I think that would be particularly interesting to see how that works out on the, on the local level. But as I said, I think that's something for future research. Mm -hmm. It's great that you mentioned the displaced persons. We have uh, been like Christopher, the representative of our new ERC project by Kerstin von Lingen, who really look at the displaced person narrative and practice in many different locations. Yeah. Um, we have three people on the list. and more questions ready to come. So we have to manage <laughs> time. So it could be on the beat with you. Yeah. Uh, so I guess my question goes in the February. Because I think your lecture was, was fantastic because you are sketching, apart from all the empirical issue, you are sketching a, a very sophisticated way to understand historical processes. And therefore, my question is, how do, you, how do we write complexity? And so how would you write complexity in your book? Because you are, you are telling us basically that when they were punishing, they were not punishing the same different groups. They were punishing not the same in, the same, in, in different times that they were using different authorities to do that, et cetera, which is, I find fascinating because it's the same, this, this complexity is the same that I find in the Spanish Empire in the 17th and 18th century. But you can find that in Franco's Spain, you can find in many. So the, the problem that I want to, to raise is how do we then tell this complex uh, story instead of going to this linear part. Somehow it connects to the question of global history and which kind of global history you want to have without hyper simplifying this complexity, which is the core business of how power was administered in the end and punishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a really good question I've been thinking about because sometimes when I talk about, but if I can talk about the book, what I'd love to do is be like, and people the book and be like, just read it, you know, because yeah. I won't be able to convey the complexity in a talk um, as the way I think hopefully the book can do in writing. But um, so, um, so I think one thing that I also struggled with as I was sort of revising the dissertation, going back to the archives, um, restructuring the entire sort of um, uh, manuscript at, at some point, sort of because I included more of the warriors, everything had fallen apart. So I kind of felt like, am I going to be able to pull this back together eventually? But as I was doing that, um, sort of I talked to, to another historian who said, well, so what's, you know, just let us know. So what's the difference between Eastern and Western Belarus? And then how is Belarus different from Ukraine and from Western Russia and from the Baltics? And I, um, for, for really the time I struggled with like finding a simple answer to this until I understood that there is no simple answer to that. And it always depends on the specific questions that we look at and the issues. So we always have to differentiate in time and place. Meaning that in a general sense, I can tell you there are similarities and differences between Western and Eastern Belarus, but I think there's no, no other way of actually being like taking the time to, to sort of look at what specific issue, issue and question we are looking at. Um, and I think it remains a challenge then to put that into a talk and be able to do bring it back together to a large argument. So, so in that sense, I probably don't have a, um, a very conclusive answer to that, except for 
um, I, it was very much a challenging five minutes. Yeah. That would be nice to read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Um, yeah, I very much like the you new know, reflections being, you know, presented. And I'd like to know more about the distinction between the private and the and what was it, the official memory. So the the distinction between these two, I mean it's the same person that tells the story maybe differently to where he or she tells it. And and I very much like the four uh, light stories you presented. <laughs> that makes it all the four individuals and even the photos that makes it always yeah, life. To, to, and instead of just thinking of mass as a move from one place to another. And I'd like to know more about their um, memoirs because you mentioned that at least two of the four were kind of artists or writer who then had a memoir. And these were was now published materials or, or was it a private diary that you found in the archive or how common was it then for Belarusian to write down the memories or the experiences of the mm -hmm. war or the post-war era. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, um, a really good bit still. In, uh, essentially, I've been to many different libraries. Um, it, it's a mix of um, where most of these memoirs were published after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and Olga Wendel, the other side, the memoirs are also interesting because she reflects upon how she thought, for example, of, of the, the, the trials, the show trials in the 1930s. And, and later on sort of reflects on her own position, how she changes her mind about what she saw back then. And then, so we see sort of how, how in all cases, these are individuals whose life are heavily affected by the Second World War. And they use memoirs as a way to try to, I think, try to make sense in some ways of the experiences because it's so ever present um, and they live every day with that. Um, so most of them are, I said, like memoirs written after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, some not. I think there's a certain imbalance in the memoir literature, which is that we have more literature memoirs from people who came from Western Belarus and who then left right after the war and either um, went to Palestine or the United States. And I think their memoir literature is also shaped by, by conventions. On a very basic sense, I often thought that they talk much more about feelings in some ways, because I think there was a different kind of vocabulary developed in the 1980s on in the memoir in the Holocaust literature about talking about personal trauma. Whereas, um, whereas the memoirs that were published after the fall of the Soviet Union were people who, who, um, who lived in, in the former Soviet republics, it's not that they don't talk about feelings, but you can tell that they are different kind of different vocabulary that shapes the way in which they obviously we talk about. And I think that might also um, speak to me, uh, Mich uh, Misha's question about, um, about how at these trials people position themselves to the, in, within the larger political force field. And so we can see, for example, um, Marta Havlushko is, has, is working on that, it was written about that in trials where um, women recount um, rape um, at the hands of local citizens during the war, Jewish but also non-Jewish victims of rape. Um, when they, in the mid 19 to late 1940s, speak to Soviet investigators, they also obviously, um, I mean, these are rich historical sources because they tell us a lot about sexual violence during the war, but they do also position themselves in, in, in a sort of larger Soviet context. So they would often start by emphasizing how they came from kind of good Soviet families, so to say, and the, the, the contribution that they'd made to Soviet life, I think perhaps as a strategy to kind of, to, um, to give more credibility, perhaps or to be afraid that this might give more credibility to, to talking about a topic that was so difficult to talk about anyway, but, but even then sort of there wasn't really vocabulary and sensitivity for, for sexual violence or war crimes yet. So, um, so we see differences in, in how that, how the political kind of force feed, but then also political changes over time in, in impact the memoir literature. Yes. Yes, thank you. By the way, this clock is five minutes past, so we have more time. Oh, yes, more time. Yeah. <laughs> um, not, not to use this as an excuse to ask a particular <laughs> question. Uh, but, um, no, my question is basically, um, it's about these, I guess, about these these waves that you mentioned. I mean, on the one hand, you say there are no there are no such clear answers. It depends on context, etc. But you did say there were waves. There were hard. There were waves of harsher sentences. There were waves of more lenience, etc. And my question would be, how do we explain these waves while you know also looking at? I mean, 
from what I understand, you also look sort of at the, at the dynamics of these trials. Um, this question, how much, you know, how, how, how well, in a sense, how professionally justice was administered. So I guess my question would be, how do the verdicts come about, for instance? So is there like a preordained guideline that, okay, you have to administer at least five years, maybe 10 years, 15, 20, I don't know, death sentence or not. Were there like central guidelines that judges have to, had to respect, had to follow? Um, were people actually acquitted? That would be another question. Like, to, could, could you say, do you have like percentages, how many people were found guilty and to what they were sentenced and who was acquitted on what grounds? So how much leeway was there really? You know, to, to, to cut a long story short, how much leeway was there within these trials? Because you also mentioned the term show trial, no? the assumption, and I, if I understood you correctly, you're saying those were not just show trials. And in a show trial, you would think that, you know, the sort of the, the final verdict is, has already been written before. But I guess in this case, it wasn't. And yet you do have these waves. So how, how do sort of the local dynamics and perhaps central guidelines, et cetera, um, interact? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, so I think during the war, it starts, these, these waves are a result of, um, um, you know, the, the trials starting with the prosecution, starting by being extremely harsh and almost not discriminating between different um, different types of, of, of acts. And um, and this is something that um, the, the sort of what you call the Soviet politics of retribution. There are also many other scholars, Tanya Penta, for example, um, Vanessa Rosin, um, and, and, and others who've worked on that. Um, um, Vanessa Vazan worked on that for Kalinin uh, Oblast, Western Russia, um, um, Tanya Penta for Ukraine. And, and if we bring all of that together, we can see that, that there are very similar patterns across the board. But I said, like these, um, these patterns, there's a, um, in, throughout the, then in 1942, 1943, um, we see a conflict continuing, which, which really comes from the interwar years between the, um, the prosecutor side and the state security organs. And essentially, the center then becomes increasingly alarmed by reports by the prosecutors, by prosecutors who are um, after the military tribunals who are saying that the state security organs aren't properly qualifying the crime, so that they are not being careful enough. And so I think this is what I mean by the technical administration of justice. There are lawyers there, and they, it's about technical, correct applicability of law, so to say. And so then the center, so the, um, uh, the political center, then issues a series of instructions that aim to clarify. Um, also, because there's an increasing sort of sense of the complexity um, in, in documents, internal documents after the war, people who are deemed to have collaborated with the Germans are often just called people who have worked for the Germans, which is super wide, right? Because it's, it's everybody from like somebody who served in an SS formation to a local teacher. Um, and, and one part of the answer to that is that they, they're always, they, they never really quite figure out what to make of that. So the case of policemen seems easier to judge. And so there you can then introduce categories between traitors and accomplices at some point. But when, when it gets beyond policemen and town mayors and, and, and even villages, it becomes a lot more. Um, so, um, um, sorry, I think I lost kind of track of one thing that I wanted to say about how these these wave of trials come about. Um, oh, acquittal waves. Um, so again, we have to differentiate between the, the secret prosecutions and the, the public trial and the prosecutions. At these public trials, people are only being put on trial if, if the state security organs who are conducting the pretrial investigations and the prosecutors feel that this is a safe case. So it's clear from the outset that people are going to be convicted. The question is, what sentence are they going to receive? And I think at the these local trials of um, of Soviet citizens, there is more leeway for local for the local NKVD and then for the central authorities. At these public trials of German and Axis soldiers, that's different. Um, so here we have at this trial that took place in um, Chernihiv, for example, um, there's a secret commission in Moscow that's in charge of organizing these trials. And they hand down, this is very centrally organized, they hand down, um, they give the Chenyev and can be a, a month to organize the trial, to find defendants, to find lawyers, to find uh, witnesses. And then um, they, before the trial then starts, they have to, um, they have to travel to Moscow and report to the secret commission. 
And the one who is in charge of the secret commission is Vyshinsky, um, who was also secretly in charge of the, the Soviet commission at Nuremberg and who was um, the Soviet family prosecutor and played a large role in the short trials. We see personnel continuity here. And in these trials, again, it's clear that everybody is going to be, the public trials is going to be um, sentenced. We even for the 1949 trial of Japanese soldiers have seen in the archives um, the verdicts that were already pre-printed, so to say, and then there was always a blank where the sentence had to be filled in. So that's something that was determined at the trial, but then has to be sent to Moscow for approval before the verdict can go into effect. Having said that, for these trials of civil citizens as well, there is an internal review process happening. So, so if a military tribunal of a district, uh, of an oblast, a region, um, has as a verdict, the, the, the verdict is then being reviewed by the next paramilitary tribunal, and it's questions of procedural, procedural questions. And here we can see that um, these higher level military tribunals do hand them files back to the lower military tribunal and say something here, there are procedural mistakes. There isn't enough um, evidence of the person who's contradicting himself, or now he, he rescinded all what he said. So that's happening. The acquittal rate, though, is still very low compared to other cases. So, so it's in the single digits. Um, it, sh it shifts a little bit for the immediate post war years. It's around three, four, five percent. Um, so again, there are certain shifts, but if you compare it to other criminal justice systems, it's a quite low acquittal rate. So it's possible, but um, um, very unlikely. So, so. 